Good afternoon, and welcome to the Department of the Interior. I'm Tracy Bates, Chief Curator of the Department of the Interior Museum, and we're so pleased to be hosting Doug Lean. You might know him better as Ranger Doug, Ranger of the Lost Art, as part of the Interior Museum's ongoing public program series. It's serendipitous that he joins us in the museum's uh, 80th anniversary year, as uh, 2018 is our 80th anniversary. We opened in 1938. And 1938 uh, just happens to be the very same year that these iconic National Park posters that you're seeing and hearing about today were first starting to be created. They were both born of challenging economic times of the Great Depression and then fueled by creativity. Doug Lean is very much a Renaissance man, and we learned that he also plays the piano, uh, but he has many talents and has worn many hats. First, as a veteran. After high school, Doug spent two years in Vietnam as a Navy CB, building airstrips for the 3rd Marine Division. As a college student, earning his degree from the University of Washington in geology. Then, as Ranger Doug, spending seven seasons with the National Park Service in the late 1960s and early 1970s at Grand Teton National Park as Dr. Doug, a dentist for more than three decades, 20 years in private practice in Seattle, and more than a decade in Alaska as a rural dentist working for several native health corporations. And also as Captain Doug, a tugboat enthusiast, completing a 10-year restoration of his 1899 tugboat Katahdin, which he has lived aboard and has working in Alaska waters as a contract and charter tug. Today, I probably don't have to tell you, you're in for a real treat, and that comes from the Ranger Doug portion of Doug's many pursuits. And if you were lucky enough to hear Doug when he was last here in conjunction with our posterity exhibition in 2014, almost four years ago to the day, don't worry, he has lots of new stories to regale us with this afternoon. He'll be telling you about a 50-year quest through dusty garages and attics, junk shops and even courtrooms to rediscover, collect, bring attention to and preserve these exceedingly rare National Park posters created by WPA artists working for the National Park Service between 1938 and 1941. At the conclusion of Doug's formal remarks, he'll be making a very special presentation, and for that he'll be joined by Dan Smith, the acting director of the National Park Service. Dan has nearly four decades of public service throughout the executive and legislative branches, but is certainly no stranger to the Department of the Interior, having been with us in the early 1980s and again in this new millennium. Dan's roles in the National Park Service um, have included serving as its deputy director, as a special assistant to the National Park Service director, as the assistant director of legislative and congressional affairs, and as superintendent of Colonial National Historical Park. Dan has also served as Interior's Deputy Assistant Secretary for Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Due to the various components and complexity of today's program, we're gonna ask you to please hold your questions for Doug until the very end. Doug spent 2016, the National Park Service centennial year, putting over 44,000 miles on his vintage Airstream trailer, sharing the history of these posters in small group settings, and having that time to talk one-on-one -on -one with folks is something that he really enjoys. So in that spirit, he'll be seated down front afterwards so that you can speak with him, ask him your questions, have him autograph any of your prints that you may have bought, brought with you, and of course, have a chance to look more closely at the original prints that Doug and our amazing colleagues at the Library of Congress and the National Park Service have reunited today for this exclusive one afternoon only display. But for the moment, and without any further ado, please sit back and do join me in welcoming Doug Lean. Can everybody hear me okay? Good. Tell me if it's too loud or too soft. Thank you, Tracy, very, very much. Well, uh, it was exactly, I think within a few days, four years ago today, I stood on this very same stage and presented quite a similar talk. Uh, and since that time, uh, I've traveled 44,117 miles in 15 months to search for uh, as many of these prints as I could find. Many uh, were already known, but they were uh, tucked away and whatnot. Uh, I thought today would be a good time to bring them all in one room. I'm gonna, at the end of this talk, I'm gonna donate my private collection of that at one time numbered about eight. Uh, some of these are from the Library of Congress and a couple are from National Parks on loan. So this is the, what, this is the total known 
collection of WPA artwork all in one room, minus one Yosemite, and uh, it, it may even walk in the door. I'm still working on it. <laughs> so uh, where can I start? When I first came in this room, I actually had tears in my eyes when I saw all of these prints for the first time up in front of me because these have never been together. They were made uh, about 100 copies each. 14 parks made them between 1938 and 41. The first one was the Grand Teton print. This one right straight behind me, which I fished out of a burn pile in uh, Grand Teton National Park. And it kind of piqued my curiosity. The year was 1971, so it was almost, uh, what was that, 47 years ago, 40, 47 years ago. So it took me uh, almost 50 years, 47 years in this case, to um, put this, this puzzle back together. I had no idea what I had, and I only had one print in my hand. So here's the story. Uh, let's take the next slide here and see if this works. Just a little bit about me. I think Tracy's already said pretty much all of this, but um, I really was a ranger seven years in Grand Teton National Park. I worked in Jenny Lake Ranger Station, this ranger station here in the poster uh, in Mountain Rescue. It was one of the best jobs of my life, uh, changed my life. Um, and today I'm going to go back and do more volunteer work in the national parks. Uh, just, just love the parks. My goal, of course, is to get 14 prints. There, there were only 14 made. There are 11 here today. The 12th was going to walk in the door any minute. And two more I've never found, and I'll go over these in a minute. So my goal is to find these 14 and, and bring them back into one in the public domain. And also to hang a poster reproduction in every home in America. I want people to know what great things the WPA did for the National Park Service. And it's not just posters. They, you'll see in a minute. Um, I'm a dentist, as we've already brought up. I'm a for, also a for-profit company. Uh, I pr re produce these and sell them to National Park bookstores. We've raised... Uh, close to about $8 million in sales through uh, retail wholesale relationships. I also have a 1%, uh, um, it's not a foundation, but I give 1% back. This is a WPA formula that was developed back in the 30s to beautify buildings and make them, uh, you know, this is for art and buildings, and sculptures in the front yards and things like that. So I've kept this 1% starting about 1992. And, since then, we have 1% for the planet with Patagonia, and there's many, many other organizations now that are doing this. I'm not saying I started it, but the WPA started it. But with this 1%, uh, you'll see a couple projects here in a minute. Visit me at rangerdug.com if you have any questions. This talk will be posted there. The four-year-ago talk will be there. My whole uh, park tour will be on that, uh, and there are many, many other things. We're on NPR radio. Uh, uh, that's also on there. So let's uh, see if we can get this button to work. This is one of the 1% projects. This is in Calaveras State Park. It's next to uh, Kings Canyon. And uh, the CCC built these old fireplaces and they needed to be re re removed or replaced. And so we ended up uh, uh, rebuilding them. And so one of my many little projects. This is in Stanislaus uh, National Forest. It's uh, CCC buildings. I work with the Student Conservation Association, fund them, and we buy them tools. And the kids go out and they rebuild these buildings instead of tearing them down. So four years ago, almost to this day, uh, I was in the Interior Department. And we started this, uh, this exhibit that was, uh, ran for 14 months across the hall here at the uh, museum. And after the exhibit, I went to John Jarvis, the director of the Park Service, and said, hey, this is a turnkey deal, ready to go. Uh, let's throw it in the back of my car, and I'll be your ambassador. And, and John said, we don't have any money for the for this uh, kind of thing. With So I ended up doing it privately. So it was... Uh, the most interesting three years, as it turns out, of my life. Uh, let's see if we... Now here's the exhibit as it ha happened three years ago. And this is the son of the artist. Uh, this is Richard Powell. Oops, what happened here? <laughs> I think it's going to go even again. R Richard Powell, I'll just stay on this one. His father is Chester Don Powell, and he's now credited to be the artist that made these prints. We have pretty good photographic proof. The first print, the Grand Teton, and the very last print, the uh, bandolier are questionable because the art styles are so different. And one was the very first one uh, derived from a diorama that you'll see in a minute. And the other last one was just before World War II. So uh, we'll give credit for the 12 of the 14 at least to C. Don Powell, Richard Powell. Um, finally got him up here to interior and, and uh, gave him a tour through the, his father's work, and about two months later he passed away, so this was his last. 
So what does a guy do when he goes on a 15-month road trip in the National Park Service? He calls up his buddy in California who has four chicken houses full of these things. And I picked out a 1948 uh, trade wind. It's, it's serial number three. It's probably built by Wally Byam. And I'm a sucker for antiques. As if you saw my 1899 tugboat, you'd understand why. So I, bu I bought this uh, trailer, uh, one of these, and polished it up, put an air conditioner on the top, and in the inside of the trailer, I put Thomas Molesworth furniture. I spent all winter in Cody, Wyoming, working with uh, the heir to the heir apparent to the uh, Molesworth Furniture Company, and they built a lot of the lodges of the West furniture. They built Camp David, uh, this kind of thing. And uh, you can see the, uh, the uh, uh, Sequoia Cone uh, door poles and this kind of, kind of thing. And this is, uh, you recognize the motif over the, the, uh, the kitchen sink here. It's, comes from your interior department. I, I stole it and I, I copied it. <laughs> so I did all around the country, literally twice uh, in various configurations. This is the Pacific Northwest, the North Cascades National Park, if you haven't been there. I did the first ascents of many of these big faces in 1967 and 8 with Fred Becky, who also just passed away uh, just a, about a month ago. Uh, so here we are going over the North Cross State Highway. This is San Diego, California, near actually uh, Morro. Bay State Park. This is, uh, uh, you all know where this is, it's in uh, Key West, Florida. And uh, this is Acadia. Uh, and this is a Vietnamese family. These are our new American tourists. I greeted them all in Vietnamese. I spent two years in Vietnam and, and it surprised the heck out of them, so they wanted a picture with me. But uh, they were all working for as, as, as clerks and uh, whatever in uh, Saigon and uh, saved up their money and came to America. They have heard nothing but incredible things about America. This is one of my talks. I gave 77, 75 excuse me, formal presentations to libraries, museums, uh, uh, campfire programs. My, uh, just some statistics. My worst uh, talk was attendee had one. It was uh, 8 o'clock in the morning at the Pasadena Convention Center, I think on New Year's Day, and, and how many people are going to get up at 8 in the morning? And, and he was a Chinese, uh, he was a Chinese descent. He was, he, his... Um, Lived in L.A., he painted watch faces for high-end watches. Very interesting fellow. So I said, well, let's come back and sit at my trailer. The trailer was in the uh, Pasadena Convention Center. So we spent a couple hours. I told him this same story, and he ended up buying about $1,300 worth of posters so I could actually get gas to the, for, in, all the way into Texas with that. And we did 75 talks. I met uh, Teddy Roosevelt himself. Uh, and then here's, uh, okay... <laughs> So that was my, that was my whirlwind trip, 44,000 miles, uh, went through one car, I should mention that. So what is known about the WPA posters? That's the big question. In 1987, this book was published by Chris Noon. And Chris, uh, I called him up because I had found this Grand Teton poster and I was kind of curious about whether it was made by WPA and I didn't know for sure. And uh, the, in Chris's book, he talks about um, between 1935 and 1943, two million posters were produced. Two million posters. Today, only 2,000 of those posters have ever turned up. It's one-tenth of one percent. So 99.9 percent .9 of our public poster art is gone forever. It's lost. So there are 35,000 designs. If there's only one copy each, which there aren't, there are du duplicates, of course, we have 33,000 prints that are gone forever. Fortunately, the P Park Service has 14 of, well, we have 12 of the 14 prints, excuse me. I'm still looking for these two. But that's how rare these are. And when I heard these numbers, I, I was frankly quite alarmed. I, I you know, I uh, realized somebody had to do something. So I started this mission to go out and find these, these prints. So I called Chris Noon up and asked him if, he'd, if they did any national park posters. And he said, no, they, they didn't do any national park posters. So here's the author of the book that didn't even know that the National Park Service had WPA commissioned posters. This book has been republished now, um, re rewritten, I should say, by Ennis Carter. It's a, is Ennis here today? He was invited? No. Nope. Um, this is a great book. It has all the National Park posters in it, whole chapter on it. Um, and it's kind of the definitive book today if you want a nice coffee table book. I'm going to go over a couple other books here real quickly. This is a Park and Recreation Structures, and this is my Bible. Uh, this is the three-volume series done in 1935. It was again published in 19... Uh, 89 is by Greystone Press and then once more again. All these, by the way, I've seen people taking notes, but all these will be on the website as links so you don't have to write anything down. 
the, uh, inside this book are, is basically the architecture of our national parks and state parks. Uh, and I actually build an outdoor kitchen in, in this style uh, up in Alaska. I like it so much. The uh, one other group I want to talk about is the National New Deal Preservation Association. I never can get that out. Kathy Flynn was the secretary, assistant secretary of state of New Mexico, and she got tired of seeing buildings getting torn down with WPA art in them. So she began a, a movement to create a, a outpost or whatever a group in every state of the union and uh, identify these buildings, put them on a register, and try to preserve them. And she, uh, I've twice now given talks to her group. And she's a, just a wonderful woman. Uh, really done a lot for public art. Uh, go to her website. It's again on my website. On my website is a link to her website. And uh, this is one of the states that Texas just came out with on their, uh, some of their uh, catalog CCC structures. This is Fort Davis in Texas. Okay, so that's enough for books. So I began, to be, uh, began my ranger career in 1970. Uh, I was a, what's called a subject of furlough. I could stay nine months of the year, but I couldn't stay 12. I had to leave for three months. So, of course, I stayed nine months. And uh, this is the park I was in. When I first got there, the Park Service was only 54 years old. Today, it's 102. In fact, when I got there, the mountains are only this high. Today, they're much higher. My job was, to, uh, was working in mountain rescue. This is my absolutely intrepid 1967 uh, Chevy Suburban, I believe, and with a huge, flashing, intimidating red light on the top and in front of the Jenny Lake Ranger Station. <clears throat> so this is... Uh, oops, I hit the button. It's a little lag here. That's going to stay. This is a, a mountain rescue helicopter we had. It was a Bell 280 turbocharged uh, helicopter. It would, uh, looks like it was made in somebody's backyard with an erector set. And I actually got inside that glass bubble and flew up in the air in that thing. And Barney, our pilot, was about this high, and he was about the same, same width. And I wore patent leather shoes and a tam o hat, and he would fly us around in these mountains and telling us how crazy we were to climb mountains. And I said, Barney, just get us on the ground, and we'll take it from there. <clears throat> but it, we were exciting times. We got $3.10 an hour in those days. This is, uh, I think I missed the slide here, so I'm going to go back. This is the Beaver Creek Number 8, my first residence, built by the CCC. Used to be the superintendent's house. Next door is this barn. Inside this barn was this poster right here. And uh, we were cleaning it out, and everything was going up to the dump. Uh, Dunbar Susong was, uh, here's the poster. Dunbar Susong is my uh, sub-district ranger, so we uh, uh, threw all this stuff in the, in the back of the pickup truck, and, uh, and I fished this thing out and stuck it in the front seat and took it up to my cabin because I was a Jenny Lake Ranger, and why not? And then it was kind of okay, cool, but it wasn't just really, I don't know what the word is today, but, <clears throat> but it was kind of neat, and I hated to see it uh, go to the burn pile. Also, it looked like it, it was a screen print, so there must be other copies. It was done for a purpose, and there might be other parks. So this sat on my, uh, in my cabin, went back to college with me when I went back into the dentistry program at UW, uh, followed me for about 25 years, and it was... About 1992, my uh, boss's wife, Charlene Milligan, who called me up and said, hey, we're moving the Jenny Lake Ranger Station. I think this is the next picture is of the station here. And there it is. This is the building that it was commemorating. But this is right on the lake shore. And so the park in about 1992 wanted to move all of the, the parking lots and everything off the shoreline. So she called me up and said, do you have a great idea, or any good ideas for a poster for the Jenny Lake Museum since you were a ranger there? And I said, not only do I have a good idea, I've got the poster. And she said, well, send it down to us and we'll make copies of it. And I said, oh, no, no, it'll end up in the burn pile again. So I lived in Seattle, and that's where really all the screen printers are. And Moose, Wyoming, not so many. So we kind of did this fundraising thing where we, I think we printed 500 of these, and we uh, sold them for 20 bucks. And they're four-color screen print, and uh, we kind of broke even. It wasn't really great. So the next year, I went back to Charlene, and I said, uh, well, we've got to make, make another round of this thing. And she said, no, we've done that. And, and uh, I said, well, I'll make a Yellowstone, or I'll just make it up. And we'll put them side by side, and we'll sell three times as many. Yellowstone, Grand Teton, and then the, the market potentiation, whatever you want to call it. And so I finally convinced her to do that. So we started looking around. I got an artist, I hired, a, uh, tried to hired an artist to do a print, uh, just made up a design, uh, and then I thought, you know, before I print this, I really ought to do my homework a little better. Called Charlene back and said, hey, 
who made this first print? And, and are there others? And she said, well, check with the Harper's Ferry collection, Tom Durant. So I called Tom Durant up. He picked up the phone and he said, strange you should call today, but uh, I'm sitting in front of a Grand Canyon print, that one there. And they want to print this and they wanted to know the provenance. So I've been digging all these papers out of my files. And uh, I said, well, does the Grand Canyon print have the ranger meet the ranger at the top? And he said, no, it doesn't have anything. So I was kind of dejected at first, and I said, well, do you, what other, do you have any others of these? And he said, well, I've got a whole stack of negatives, 13 negatives of uh, other posters. And I said, what's, do you have one of Grand Teton? Yeah, I, what's it say? Meet the Ranger Naturalist at Jenny Lake Museum. So I knew this was the holy grail I found, but in black and white negatives, no posters. But I had one. So I caught the next flight out to, to uh, Washington, D.C., I rented a big fast car, got a ticket going out to Harper's Ferry. I was so anxious to get out there and met Tommy, just a prince of a guy, and he spent a couple of days with me uh, going over all the history of these and these photographs. And I said, I've got to get a set of these photographs, the, the copies of these negatives. And fortunately, a patient of mine in Seattle, Ed, um, uh, Chuck Odegaard, was a patient of mine. You probably know Chuck. He looks like your twin brother, by the way. Are, are you related? <laughs> Yeah, he's a great guy. He was a patient of mine in my dental practice, and so I was telling him the story, and he said, I'll get him for you, and so he got Kent Bush, who was his archivist in the Northwest region, this before the Western region, and we got the set of these prints made of high-density, low-density, black-and-white negatives. So using those negatives as a template, as, a, as information, I should say, and the only print that I had, the Teton, as a template, I restored each screen. There are about 100 screens in these 13 black and white photographs. Now, you remember before I said there are 14 prints, so there's one missing here. We'll get to that. So this is what I had to work with. The Grand Teton I already had. Yellowstone was in pretty good shape, but some of these were not. This is the Grand Canyon as I had it, but Grand Canyon had called and said they had an original. So I called up Kim Bukite down at Grand Canyon, and they sent me a color photograph. So we had that to work with. Mount Rainier was totally washed out on Gibraltar le ledges and the Gibraltar rock. And we, at the very bottom, just above the word mount, there's a made by WPACCC. Missed that entirely on the first edition. So I, I didn't have all the information I needed, but I had enough. So we slowly redrew the screens. It took me five years. The cost was about $150,000. There was 100 screens. They all had to be hand-drawn. It took me uh, five years. And I funded it through sales of each of the editions. So it took me 14, 13 editions to pay for the, before I even started making a nickel at this thing. But it was fun. The, this is the Yellowstone print. I'm going to talk just a little bit about the design on this. This was taken from a photograph by F.J. Haynes. And it was, the, I believe this photograph was taken about 1904. And uh, it's a three-lobed, I call it the three-lobed geyser. Uh, and this, is, this made its way iconically through just about every national park uh, uh, Yellowstone image there is. This is the uh, Northern Pacific Railway used it for their posters. The, the, uh, the postage stamp, uh, this is George Alexander. For, this is W.F.J. Haynes. And this is part of a larger set of, of, of stamps. Correct me here, uh, Tracy, but it's uh, George Alexander Grant, Grant, three presidential names. It was the photograph five of these pictures, the, these stamps that you see here took the original photographs. So we had F.J. Haynes, we had uh, Grant, and then we had Ansel Adams. And so this became a, a stamp uh, collect, uh, uh, series that came out approximately during FDR's time, I think. And uh, they're still available today. You can still buy them and lick them and put them on envelopes and they'll still mail somewhere. So working from black and white photos, I had to guess the colors, and I just made them up. And I looked at old brochures. Uh, this brochure I actually had not found. So I just made up the colors, and it turns out that, that uh, Haynes, in the Haynes Guide in 1938, used the same, uh, the blue, red, and the, or, or the orange, and, uh, and whatnot. They used the yellow. So I was kind of on the right track, but I'm totally guessing. But this is, of course, where the genesis of this idea came from. Again, the, the cover of the book, the the uh, WPA poster, the stamp, all came from the F.J. Haynes photograph. This is the colors it turned out to be. And if you look very carefully, at the very bottom, you'll see the initials right here, EM. And that was a screen printer. WPA artists could not sign their work. 
So they would secretly scratch the, their initials in the design somewhere. And, and three of these prints bear these initials, and there might be one in Great Smoky Mountains. It's, it's in the, um, it, it's, we can take a look at it here. Actually, we can't because we don't have one. <laughs> we have the photograph of it. But I can show you where I think it is. So that's, let's talk about where, how this thing started. In 1938, August 26, Dory Yeager wrote a, a letter to Boss proposing this project, this poster project, to Boss Pinkley. Frank Pinkley was a superintendent of Southwest Monuments in Coolidge, uh, Arizona, I believe. And uh, the, he sent along a sample uh, of the Grand Teton print. That was the one done. And he, what I like is he said that, th that this is just an experiment, if you read right in here somewhere, and it more or less is an experiment, it does not in any way represent the best that can be obtained by the process. Future posters, especially the lettering, will be a much higher standard. And if you look at these, I think the Teton is actually the best fonts and the best uh, poster design. And it's only four color. So anyway, th th this was, uh, th th these were made uh, for twelve dollars, hundred. They recommended doing them in lots of a hundred, and I went back to the archives and and found where they actually printed one hundred each of these for most of the parks. So we figure about fourteen hundred were made. Twelve cents a piece, pretty good deal. This is Dory Yeager's daughter. She came. She was in one of my talks. Came up to me afterwards. So it was a real pleasure to meet her. She was tickled pink, and she she had published a book. Her her father, Dor, had written. I don't know how many people know this book, Bob Flame, but it's uh, it's on my reading list. And uh, she signed the, post, the book, and I signed a poster for her. It's a real, real, real treat. So there are three of these prints that we know to exist, that I know to exist. This is the one that is here in the display. This is the one that, that came up in, in an auction that I'll describe in a minute, because many of these prints here came from the same auction, but this had a big cutout on it where they would put the campfire programs. This poster today is in Grand Teton National Park. This would also, this cutout s saved this print from being sold at auction, and nobody bid on it. They, they bid on it, but not the, the, the reserve, so I called the owner up. I knew the owner, and uh, uh, he agreed to sell it to me if I donated it to the park. So today, this same poster hangs every summer in the Grand Teton National Park in the Jenny Lake Museum right where it started from. And I just found out through with the archivist, it's where it is, Nancy, that, that, no, actually, I found out through Bridget Guild that on the back of, the, of this one with a cutout, it says there's a CCC dance Saturday night on the, written on the back in pencil. And I've never seen the poster. I've only seen it uh, in pictures. So I've never handled it. And this is the third one that was found in White Sands, New Mexico. came in, in in a plant press. It was too big to fit in the press. So they cut the left edge off and they cut the bottom off. So unfortunately, this poster got pretty much destroyed um, in this plant press. You might notice the colors, too, of the, of the, the rock. It, they're really pink. And I think what they did is they actually mixed inks as they needed to. They, they probably ran out. They didn't want to go over and ruin ink, so they made just little batches and trying to break even at the end. So the colors of these posters actually changed sometimes during the printing process. So the Grand Teton was the first one. Where did they get the idea for this? This was actually created, we think, um, and Nancy, you, you can help me again on this. But this was a, a prototype of a, a diorama that was made. They're very popular in the 30s. They were also made by the Western Museum Labs. And this was the, this was the prototype for the, the uh, Grand Teton diorama. And here's the actual finished diorama before it was shipped out. This sat in the ranger station where I worked. I walked around this thing a thousand times. And then in my later years, I called the park and said, whatever happened to that diorama? And they said, well, we couldn't fit it out the door, so we cut it in half, and it went half and half to the dump. So we missed that one. But the, many of the parks still have these. They were also built by the Western Museum Labs, and I guess the Eastern Museum Labs built them as well. By the way, the Western Museum Labs are in Berkeley, California. You're gonna, we're going to visit there in a minute. But anybody know where the Eastern Museum Labs are? Where We know we've got one hand here. It's, it's on the ups, upstairs of Ford... Ford's Theater. Did I get that right? And uh, I went there and visited just to see if I could see the lab. Well, of course, it's an open dome ceiling. But So I talked to the, to the park ranger there, and they said that the, the, in 1884, the Army t acquired the building because they wouldn't let, the public wouldn't let, the, it, let it be open because it was a, mem a memorial to uh, Lincoln's death. And they would burn it down if they t tried to, to stage uh, productions there again. So the Army took it over and made a medical uh, museum, I think, out of it. 
and uh, they put these layers of flooring in between the, the, these, uh, the, the, the different levels, and uh, they filled it up with so much junk, one of the floors collapsed, killed 22 people. Part of Ford's theater, I didn't know. So the, 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 the original posters, it, the, the poster project was started in 19, about 1935 with Mayor LaGuardia, actually before that. It was in New York City. Uh, people were, uh, they were drinking too much and they were not getting out, according to the mayor. So he made posters called Fishing Tuesdays and he had these anti-gambling campaigns. He put 50 artists in a room. He'd put one poster up in the front and he'd say, Paint, duplicate this poster. This was the copy machine of 1935. Uh, today, of course, we have these beautiful color machines. Uh, Anthony Valonis is in this group, and he said, I can build a better mousetrap, and he literally did. It was a mousetrap-like device, and I'll he'll, he'll show it to you in a minute, but this allowed him to make multiple copies of these things in a very quick time. And if it wasn't for Anthony Valonis, we would not have two million prints printed in eight years. You'll see the press in just a minute here. So what is a silk screen? A silk screen is really a stencil, multiple times on the same piece of paper, but all lined up in all different colors. And uh, they lack the places where they do not want the ink to express through. And this is squeegee through. This is Diana Ziegler, who's, Diana, excuse me, is still here. And uh, I'm sorry, uh, what, 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 Diana? Warring. Uh, this is Diana producing uh, posters for the patrons that came to the museum exhibit. So we actually sent them home with a silkscreen print. It's four years ago. Today we use uh, films, it's basically the same process, we use films, we dissolve the emulsion on the, on the screens and uh, it's a, pretty much the same way. This is the Western Museum Laboratories where they were made, uh, 2223 Fulton in Berkeley, California. It was a hotbed of, 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 of liberal establishment then and was, is now, I guess. But uh, th this was an old land bank. T the uh, architects got a hold of it in the 50s and just made it gorgeous. Look at this. They added two more stories to it, and uh, now it's condemned to be torn down. <laughs> I think it should be saved, don't you? So we're going to go inside the building here. We'll meet a couple of WPA artists. and uh, this, this is the, uh, who knows where in the room, but let's just say it's in the main room. And in the very back here, one artist I want to introduce you to is Elizabeth Geno. And I'll just flash to these pretty fast. This is a, one of her posters that she made that was never published. But I, I really like this because the northwest has mountains, the northeast has forests, southeast has rivers, and the southwest has cactus and desert. So I talked earlier about uh, EM, but we also have DM in, in this poster here. And this, this is in the Lassen, the second print over here in Mount Lassen. The initials DM you'll read in the bottom of the screen. And DM, we believe, is Dale Miller. And this is Dale Miller here on the right. And he's probably scratching his initials right now, although this is, this is Chester Don Powell here. There we go. Who's the, the artist? And I'll show you here in just a sec. This, here we go. And this is the only photograph that really connects him to this set. Shows the Yosemite print being made, the one we still haven't found. We found it, but we can't get it. The interesting thing, too, is they built small versions of these to test their, their the screen registrations. And we learned, learned that on our own kind of uh, recently. We ended up making little tiny posters just to make sure everything kind of fit before we'd blow the screens up. The 1940 display was uh, finished and then was sent around all the parks to create more of these prints. However, World War II was looming and nobody uh, knew, nobody could read the leaves in the teacup yet. So as a result, only four... 14 of these prints were made. So after I published the 14 restored the old black and white screens, originals started turning up. And they're, of course, selling these in the parks. Uh, and, and some of the parks would, uh, like Petrified Forest, for instance, tell it, Tessie Shirakawa would uh, come up to me and, and have you ever found an original, you know, this kind of thing? And I said, search your own files. Because they're probably there. No, we don't have one. Yes, you do. You might. And sure enough, about... Oh, a year or two goes by, and Tessie calls me up. She's just excited as heck. And sure enough, she finds the original petrified forest. It's the only one ever to, to survive out of the hundred. It's, where are we? The far right here. Incredible find, nine color. 
So my colors are on the right here, as you can see. So I saddled up my uh, Ranger Dugmobile, filled it full of inks, drove down all the way down to Petrified Forest, and I spent a couple of days mixing a palette to correct the screens. And then I discovered the extra, the, the, it was nine color and not six and that kind of, actually we had eight on it. It's a beautiful print. Then Mount Rainier uh, turned up. Uh, this gentleman here on the right is, is uh, Dwayne Nelson. He's a seasonal, actually he was a permanent ranger. His two sons are seasonals in Mount Rainier. And he, he said, I've got a Mount Rainier uh, original. And I said, how do you know? He said, well, it's a different color and it's on board. And besides, he said, I snitched it out from underneath a park cabin before they torched it. <laughs> and uh, so he, he, he brought it over to my house. He had two of them. And uh, I said, well, would you sell one so I can start building this collection. This is the second one now to turn up uh, if, if, that was privately owned, that is. And he said, well, I got two sons and they each got to get one. And so, you know, I said, well, if you find a third one, let me know. Well, a year goes by, phone rings. Dale says, guess what? I found a third print. And it's still in the frame. I said, I'll be right over. So I went over to his house and here are three prints laid out on his kitchen counter, none of which I'd seen before. And what happened was he took the the posters out to clean the glass and there are three prints sandwiched together. So the middle one was in pristine condition and the two on the outsides had campfire programs glued on the, right on the poster. Forget the cutout, they just glued them on anyway. So the middle one was in perfect condition, no fading, uh, and that print is right here in the... So I made a, I made a deal with, uh, the, 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 with, with Dwayne that if he, I would pay him the Full price, we had it appraised at $1,800. It's in 1999. And I kind of grumbled about the price because I thought it was awfully expensive. And, and he said, well, I'm going to donate the money back to the Park Service anyway. I said, okay, I'll do it. And so he donated not only the money, but he also donated the two other prints. And those are currently were presented to John Jarvis. This director Jarvis, recent director John Jarvis here back in 1999. So the, the Mount Rainier now has two of the prints. Uh, there are a total of six that have turned up. Then I got, uh, in 19, 2004 and five, I got a job in Antarctica working as a dentist. And so I went down for virtually gone a year. And uh, when you're on the ice, you're really committed. You just can't pick up and leave. And this guy calls me up and said, hey, I got two prints that I found in a junk store. And uh, what, what do you know about them? And uh, what are they worth kind of thing? And... Uh, so he, I said, send me photographs. So he sent me some very crude photographs, but I realized immediately they were not my re reproductions, but originals. So I wrote him back, and I said, please go to the store, find out all you can about them. And he said, well, I hate to do that. I only paid 70 bucks a piece for them. I said, go back, and, you know, I was really getting antsy. So he, a week later, he calls me, and he said, guess what? I bought seven more. So I sent me the pictures. <laughs> so he bought a whole set, virtually nine prints, and uh, I pleaded with him, do not sell these at auction until I get back to Los Angeles. I need to look at them and just promise me it'll be a couple months. So when I got back, of course, the first thing I did was go to Los Angeles. I met with Laurent, his name, very nice fellow, he was an art collector. And uh, th these two prints, by the way, are right, uh, the, 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 the Grand Canyon is here today. This one is back in the archives because this is a second one that turned up that I'll describe in a minute. But the, the I guess it was about 2005, I got a call from the Swan Auction Gallery in New York City, and he said, are you Ranger Doug? And I said, yeah, and he says, well, I got to talk to you. And, and my heart just sank. I knew exactly where it was going. He said, well, we got these WPA prints. What do you know about them? And I said, well, I'll tell you everything I know. But I, and he asked me, of course, what they're worth. And, uh, you know, it's, it's anybody's guess. I paid $1,800 for one in 1999, five years, six years earlier. And the only way to test that out, of course, is to put it in front of a microphone. So the Swan Auction Gallery auctioned these off. And I called Laurent and said, please, can you hold off and let me find some buyers. And I called every park, by the way, matched the money. I couldn't get one taker. So all these slipped through my fingers at auction, boom, 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 like that. Well, it turns out the Library of Congress bought five of them. And I bought two, and two went large. And the two that went large were Mount Rainier, which we have six copies of. And the other one is... Uh, Yosemite, which slipped through our, both the Library of Congress's fingers and my fingers. Today, that print is in, within 50 miles of here. I've t I just, met, just talked to the guy last week. He was going to have, hopefully, bring it through the door any minute. 
but he's a very busy surgeon in the area, and, and uh, uh, I'm going to work on him. He's, he uh, would like to donate it, and I'm encur- going to encourage him to do so. But uh, anyway, the, that's the story of Laurent. <laughs> Uh, then I got another call from a fellow in Santa Cruz, California, who found six. Classic find. Uh, Dad died, went out the attic, cleaned it out, and here's six prints. Boom, boom, boom. And so this, this uh, is the only known copy of the Yellowstone Falls ever, ever found. This is one of uh, f- four, I believe, four or five uh, geysers. I'm still confused how many geysers are. These two prints are in the center of the room here today. And uh, so I negotiated two of these from, from the owner with the intent to donate them and of course that will occur in about half an hour here and since, the other, since then the other four have gone underground he told me don't call me again so I think he had seller's remorse fortunately the four that he kept are all redundant copies so we have other copies of them and they are uh, well I won't get into that right now so one of the last things that I wanted to do is find out where the artists sat and where they got the inspiration. Of course, we know the diorama and Grand Teton and the F.J. Haynes postcards for the two Yellowstones, but where did the Grand Canyon come from? So I went down to Grand Canyon, and they got a whole bunch of backcountry rangers in the room, and they said, okay, guys, where's this from? And everybody shrugged their shoulders and said, this is just made up. It's, 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 just, a, just, a, it's just made up by the WPA artists. So I, I didn't believe it. So I went down on the rim. I walked back and forth uh, actually over about two or three years trying to find this perspective. And it does not exist if you look at the, the buttes in the Grand Canyon, but it does exist if you look at the river. And this river here is this river right here. And there's a little piece back here, and it goes to here, and then this little cliff here is this little cliff here. So that, when I walked to there, all of a sudden, there it was. And so I went, went back and told the park, and this is where the, and it's out by the eastern edge, Eastern Edge as you drive in there, the Desert Tower, I think they call it the Desert Tower, Desert Tower. And uh, that's where the, the, the um, took a Jenny Lake Ranger, by the way, the backcountry ranger to figure that out. The, the Yellowstone guys are pretty good, but they don't, ma- they don't quite match up to the Jenny Lake boys. So the last one along with there's 13 negatives, but 14 prints. Uh, got a call, another call one day. By the way, all these posters find me. I don't find them. Every one of them have called me. The park calls me up and said, hey, we got a, a Bandelier WPA poster. I said, how do you know? And this was off my radar totally. And they said, well, first of all, at the bottom it says made by WPA CCC. So uh, <laughs> that pretty well took care of that. And you'll s- see it over here on the bottom of the print. I said, where did you find these things? They said, they've been in the superintendent's office for 50 years. I said, you're kidding. I've been down there several times, uh, you know, for hiking and whatnot. So it turns out they were all cut in half for file drawer dividers in their file drawers. They were just pieces of cardboard. But fortunately, they'd saved about three or four. And so one of those, they just shipped up to me. Actually, they first shipped it up in, in, in its whole form. And I said, why are you shipping these things in FedEx to me in Alaska? And uh, I said, these are kind of rare. And they said, oh, we got 13 of them, no problem, you know. And so we reconstructed it, fortunately, through computers and um, printed it as you see it. And um, and then I put the poster back in my flat files, and for five years it sat hidden in my flat files. I never returned it. So we go to make the second edition, and I open the flat files up to get the negatives out, and here's the original posters. I called call the park up real quick and had egg on my face and said, well, excuse me, but uh, do you guys want your poster back? What poster? <laughs> but this illustrates really how they're lost. They, they, they just get filed away and they're gone. Out of sight, out of mind. So anyway, I mailed it back, and actually I did not mail it back. We brought it over to the exhibit four years ago, and then from there it went into the Harper's Ferry collection because the park already has 12 copies now. So that was the last one. Here's the, the origination of the design. It was on a postcard again. And that's Ranger Doug a few years later, hot on the tracks. How many people have been to Alcove House, Bandelier National? Oh, my gosh, I'm going to get you guys out west. Real parks. This is really this is kind of really how the federal poster project ended. Uh, Dory Yeager would would uh, this is hard to read. Uh, it's on my website, but if you look carefully here, it says uh, the, he said during the past few weeks we believe we have propounded a great truth 
Uh, See, fortunately, we have always felt that the number of headaches that this job was directly proportional to the number of persons working. Nothing could be further from the truth. Well, he goes on to say, we ask for a, 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 a WPA plaster technician and we get a dental technician, which is nothing wrong with them, them by the way. And we ask for a, a person who paints lantern slides and we get a little old lady who paints teacups and this kind of thing. But what was happening in, in uh, 1940 and 41 was that people were leaving for the shipyards. Lend lease was going strong. We were building uh, three Liberty ships a day, I think, at the time to try to keep ahead of Hitler's uh, sinking them. And the Alameda shipyards were just going a mile a minute. So the, the uh, C. Don Powell, the artist, went down and started building ship models. And the Santa Cruz six that I found were also from a shipbuilder that also worked in the Santa Cruz shipyard. So there was, that's probably the connection there. But uh, this is on my website. You can read it. It's kind of cute how they go on. So where are the prints today? I found 42 of them. It's taken me 25 years. It took me 47 years, if you count the first one. But the second one came in in 1990, uh, about 1995, and now we've got 42 found. The last one I found, by the way, was a year ago. I found a Grand Canyon print uh, after the, the Federal Art Project uh, posters project shut down at uh, Western Museum Labs. The, the remnants of the collection were shipped to the U.S. Mint Building, which was a repository at the time. And then after the war in 1951, the building was again repurposed for some something, and the, 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 what was left of these were all sh uh, sent back to their respect respective parks. And three prints went back to Grand Canyon, and, and two of those made it up into the park, and one of them stayed in the librarian's house. And it stayed there since 1951 until about a year ago. And she was from Flagstaff. She was uh, uh, Flagstaff, Arizona, and uh, she died. And they probated the will and the house and all that thing. And the house sat empty, and the neighbor went over to the, meet the real estate agent look at the house. And here's this poster hanging on the wall. Nothing left in the house except this poster. It had been skipped by everybody. And it was kind of faded. So the park ended up getting this thing. The neighbor took it up to the park and said, hey, do you want this print? This was just a, a, two years ago at the most. So the park called me. I happened to be in Grand Canyon at the time. I was the keynote speaker for the Grand Canyon History Symposium, my largest audience of 350 people. And I was giving a talk there, and, and I ran over and looked at this print, and uh, they told me that it came from this librarian's house. I said, did she begin working for the park in 1951? And they said, yeah, how do you know that? <laughs> and the reason is that's when they were shipped in from the U.S. Mint Building. So these things turn up in the darndest places. So I'm just going to quickly go over these all, um, turn around a bit here. These are, uh, let's see, these are the park collections. These are the two uh, Dwayne Nelson prints that he sent, the two Gr Grand Tetons. Uh, one is the cut-up one, the other one I donated that has the cut-out in it. We have three Grand Canyons in, in park collections, one PFO, 12 bandoliers now, most of them are cut in half, for a total of 20. And then here's the Library of Congress, five that you see on the, in their website. Harper's Ferry Collection is, um, let's see, there's uh, the, the Geyser, the Teton, and Zion. These are the three that are going into the collection, I think, today. Uh, these are four of my eight left. Dale, Nel Dale uh, let's see, Dwayne Nelson. This is a private collector that went underground with his four. Swan Auction Gallery, these, uh, are, this is the Mount Rainier, which we have six copies of, so this one I'm not too concerned about right now. And the Yosemite is here in Baltimore, as I mentioned, a total of two that Swan sold. And uh, th this is, there's one anecdotal one of Yellowstone Geyser, and I talked to the dealer last week, and he's going he's gonna to show it to me. I said, I want to see it, and I don't take your word for it. So let's see, the, um, I think that's, I'm going to talk just real briefly and quickly about the contemporary versions. When I finished the 14, Parks came to me and said, hey, can you do a 15th and a 16th and so on? And I said, of course, I can forge anything at this point. <laughs> I, mean, I kind of had it down. And there are a lot of keys to making these things. If you want to learn how to make a WPA poster, uh, it's on my website. So Deb Liggett was superintendent of uh, Devil's Thumb, uh, Devil's Tower. <laughs> I live under Devil's Thumb in Alaska. And Devil's Tower, so I went out, and, we, and this is before computers. We had to actually make a, a painting. The painting today is in the National Park Archives. And, oops. And uh, so we actually made a painting, and uh, this is a, kind of a tilt up here to show some of the other variations and color palettes, and it was, it was quite a lengthy procedure. I had to draw this whole thing out. And then we traced our tracing paper and actually traced the screens just, just like we did from the black and white photos and just like the WP artist did in 1938. 
So that was really laborious and it was very expensive. And uh, to, to Deb's credit, she came up with a budget. They bought both a painting and a small inventory. And this is one of our most popular reproductions, uh, uh, contemporary reproductions. It's not a reproduction, it's a contemporary. And then I got a call from uh, Bryce Canyon National Park. Uh, Rob Dano was a chief ranger there at the time and he called me up and he just loved what I was doing. So he invited me down to the park. He took me out on a tour all around and gave me some suggestions on, you know, what would make a good WPA style poster. This is a 1990, no, 2001 or two, and computers then were just getting good. And so this was our, we, we, we made a quantum leap across the chasm and we started using computers. And boy, did we get in trouble. But the uh, first thing I did is hire somebody who knew what they were doing. And this is Brian Mabius in Texas. He's from Dripping Springs, Texas. This is one of his posters that he, Design later on, it's got the Roseville cabins at Big Ben. He sent me a couple of per, per, uh, perspective uh, ideas, and he said, you know, you could do this for the whole park service. And of course, I figured that out, but I hadn't gotten there yet because I've been working so hard on these, these 14 original ones and all the screens. So he sends me these, the, his two parks that he'd worked in, Badlands and, uh, and Dinosaur. And... Uh, so this is the Bryce Canyon. So first thing we did, we went down and took photographs. I did. It took hundreds, hundreds and hundreds. And I decided this is what I wanted to do. It's, 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 it was a forest fire going at the time. It was smoky. had had this nice depth of field for the hoodoos. The colors were muted. And it's the first poster that I, that I thought we should do without a sky in it. I don't know why I thought that, but that's what I ended up doing. So we put it in a poster thing like everybody does. This is where everybody makes their mistakes. They posterize it. And th there's a lot more in this between that step and, and this step. But we came up with a base core design, and then we had to trace the screens. Well, to trace these screens by hand, it took 13,000 mouse clicks, any one of which was pretty near fatal. It was just a disaster. So we had to figure the, the solution around that, and it was, of course, a stylus where you could actually draw the, the uh, on a screen, you could actually draw the, the, the poster, and it would put it out on an AI, called an AI file, Adobe Illustrator file. So that problem was solved. The second was the colors. What we got on a screen often didn't print. Now this is a screenshot of an actual poster, which is even probably worse, but the colors just came out awful. And we had, we, we, there's no way to test our theories other than look at it on a screen and then mix the inks and go for it. So we ended up having to redo everything. So the second edition, we actually, I think, threw away most of the first edition and then recolored it. This is what we came out with. And, and the last thing that we really had trouble with was the font. And uh, when you get a poster that was designed by a committee, in this case, Olympic Park, they all wanted their ranger station or their rivers or whatever. So we ended up having to hand draw all of text fields. And, the, and they were as laborious to draw as the, the actual design was. So we came out with a... And, and this is the, the one that we started with. Uh, we made for the exhibit t four years ago. Again, a lot of lettering in it. So we ended up using Fontographer, which is a program that you can actually draw the WPA font. This font came from Bauhaus, designed as a German, kind of Frank Lloyd Wright of Germany back in the 30s. And actually, from there, it, it came from Stalin, from the Soviet Union. That's where this font came from. Today, this font is, if you look on your Microsoft computer when you go home, you can look at NPS 1935. That's Bill Gates's version of our font. This is mine here. And you can download my font, which is better, by the way, off my website. It's free, not, not a penny. So it's, it's uh, been rediscovered. So I'm going to take you through just a quick design. This is a Hawaii, Volca Hawaii volcano, a lantern slide, 1923. Uh, this, is the, this is the design I wanted. Uh, worked with a great park... Um, archivist down there, a Hawaiian woman that just really knew her stuff and she went right straight to this file. So I drop a sketch and when you look at my sketch you can see why I hire an artist. And then he comes up with a, with a crew design to start with and this goes, it gets emailed back a dozen, two dozen times. I, I just goofed it up there by pushing it. It has an automatic fade but this is the end result of the design we came up with. And then Seattle Times, five years later, came up with this photograph after I made the print. And when I made the Hawaii print, the Pali Mamao crater it was dormant. And the first year, we sold four of these prints. I called up the Hawaiian gal, and they said, you know, come on, let's, let's got to get some marketing skills going here. and Got to put this thing up on the counter, and, 
and uh, tell them it's a silk screen as part of a WPA continuation, et cetera, et cetera. And th that same year, Holly Mau Mau Crater re-erupted for the first time in 75 years. So we actually nailed the print six, eight months and a year before it actually re-erupted. So the Seattle Times took this photograph and it ab absolutely nailed, we nailed it with a print. We're selling, the next year we sold 707 and then now we're selling over 1,500, 2,000 prints a year. It's the number one selling print because of the volcano. Who would have guessed, huh? And then from the screen printer side, you'll, this is what the screen printer sees as you lay down the inks. So first, this is again the sketch. We wanted the, the, the blue kind of, uh, there's a lag in the, the first color down is, is yellow. This is where Brian is worth his weight in gold. It's going to be seven colors at the end here. And the last color makes it all. This is, again, one of our more popular prints. And that's the, that's the lighting effect I wanted to start with that I gave Brian. It's another WPA poster. So Brian sent me the sketch, and this is what we ended up with. It's been copied, by the way, on the internet by about everybody and his brother. We, and then this is the uh, one he sent me in 1998, and today we printed this thing in 2014. So these are the contemporary, we've up to 50 prints now total, 35 contemporary, four, f roughly 14. So he doesn't want to move. My last slide is uh, where I work in Alaska. I told you I was a dentist up there. This is flying into Barrow, Alaska. What makes this slide unusual is it's February 6th, I think, is when it was taken. There's no ice. And as a result, the polar bears have nowhere to fish, or fish uh, kill seals and whatnot on ice flows. So they stay on the coastline, they walk along the coastline, what do they hit? Villages. What do they find in the villages? They find dog food on back porches. And this bear was indeed shot four hours after I took this picture. He's a two-year-old. Perfectly legal. These are some of my little dental patients. They all have little candy smears around their mouth. Cutest, you want... So I'm going to end, to end with this, uh, with Marty and Olas Miri. They're, Marty I knew for 35 years. And I don't know, do many people know Marty and Olas Miri, Miri family? Well, they're two, two half-brothers married two half-sisters. Uh, they are born in Seattle, uh, Mar Marty and Wheezy were, and uh, they moved to the Alaska. Marty was the first woman graduate of the University of Alaska. She was an absolutely remarkable woman. She lived to, be, uh, to the ripe old age of 101. And I met her in my first year of the Tetons in 1970 and I uh, used to bring her salmon down from Seattle when I come down for my seasonal work and became very, very good friends. And she spent her life working at the Arctic Refuge, p putting the Arctic Refuge basically in wilderness status, and which today we know is under threat. So I wanted to throw this slide in. She, this is the woman who probably inspired me most of my life. Um, done a heck of a lot for the national parks. And uh, this is actually from a rusty Herland painting that was done. Uh, we did an Arctic Refuge poster using the same theme. It's on our website. But this, was paint, this painting is hanging in the Museum of the North in uh, Fairbanks. It's, and Fairbanks has a liaison with the, uh, with the uh, Nupiat Heritage uh, Center up in Barrow. And it's part of a her World Heritage Site. So if you get up to Fairbanks and get up to Barrow, make sure you stop in at the Museum of the North. I'm going to uh, do some signing over here. We're going to take Q&A this side. I'd like to, at this time, introduce our acting director of the Park Service, Dan Smith. And I want to give you some posters. Thank you. <laughs> I think you maybe want to go up on the stage, maybe not. I will after we sign the posters. Oh, we can do that first. Good. Yes. But thank you for this unbelievable journey this morning, Dan, this afternoon. You got a microphone right yeah, I'm going to say he could. Thank you. That was, that was quite a journey, wasn't it? Uh, especially in an Airstream trailer. That's, that just, that just, that's talk about iconic. I'll, I'll make remarks later. Let's go sign.
Doug, on behalf of the National Park Service, I'd like to thank you for giving, rescuing, and revitalizing some of the most iconic depictions of some of America's most iconic and cherished place places. The artistic renderings featured in these posters not only captured the essence of the national parks they promoted, but they also conveyed a unique style during an important period in American history. Knowing there are only a very small number of originals left, it's an honor to receive these rare seriographs from your personal collection. Doug, your incredible journey has taken you, more to, taken you to more than 175 national parks, a remarkable achievement in itself, especially in an Airstream trailer, number three, and your enthusiasm for our national parks is infectious, as we all observe today. Your efforts have bridged the decades since these WPA posters were first printed, and through this artwork, you have introduced our national parks to new generations. Your hard work and donation will help ensure that these rare works will not be lost to history again. This event, this event marks the first time that the majority of the remaining designs have all been together in the same room. I would like to thank the Library of Congress for helping make this historic event happen, and Tracy, to you and Jason for also making this historic event happen here today at the Interior Building. Events like this bring to light the many amazing things our rangers, volunteers, and supporters do for the National Park Service. They remind us of the importance of our shared mission to protect, preserve, and share the beauty of our national parks. Doug, I proudly accept your gift to the National Park Service and encourage everyone here today, here today to take time to come up forward and look at these unique pieces of American history. Thank you very much. just wanted to echo Dan's comments, and it's really not overstating it at all to say that it gave us all goosebumps to see these all reunited here um, as, a, as a group this afternoon. And kind of a collective gasp went up when we saw them all together, and we have you, Doug, to thank for that collective gasp. Um, four years ago, when we mounted the Posterity Exhibition in the Interior Museum, we couldn't have predicted that it would result in this moment, but we are so thankful that it had, and we're just honored to uh, accept these two uh, prints into our collection and keep them for future generations. We appreciate your generosity, Doug, and we thank very much uh, Catherine Blood, Jan Grenchy with the Library of Congress, uh, Nancy Russell with uh, Harper's Ferry Center, uh, Captain Taylor today as well for their collaboration in helping us with this event and making this all possible and pulling it together. This does conclude our formal uh, part of the program, but as I mentioned earlier, uh, Doug is gonna stay uh, around uh, down at the, at the table there to talk and answer questions and sign prints for folks, and by all means, uh, invite you to come forward and, and look at these in more detail. Uh, thank you again, Doug. <laughs>